So my name's Sally B. It's lovely to see all of you here. Some faces that I've seen before, some faces that I've talked to on Facebook, and then some new ones. And can I just say that the, the new ladies and gents that are here, you're all absolutely incredible. You, you, some of you are six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks, a few months out. And the fact that you've actually taken on board something very scary and managed to venture out of the house is a great thing. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my experience and hopefully help some of you along the way. I'm not going to tell the whole story because some of you have heard it before. But my story began, uh, I can't do numbers, but in 2004, however many years ago that was, quite a few, um, I was a mum of three young children. I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a nine-month baby girl and I collapsed, had my first heart attack. That was diagnosed as indigestion and I was sent home with Gaviscon medicine for the night. Or, you, you might recognize that. All night uh, I was up, I can remember being on all fours on the bed, feeling like I had trapped wind, like I had a burp inside me. I know, look, look we, we can all share these things here, can't we? It doesn't matter. I really needed to burp and it wasn't happening. Actually, that was probably a heart attack happening all through the night. I then carried on as normal, uh, as normal as you can with three young children. And, um, but I did feel something had definitely changed. Uh, a few days later, I was clearing up the tea remains from the kids, uh, messy little buggers that they are, and the pain hit me again. Um, I'd been diagnosed with bad indigestion, so I thought, oh, and they said possibly a hiatus hernia. I was 36, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke. Um, I wasn't overweight. I had none, as, as you guys have said, there were none of the normal predisposing factors to make them think it would be my heart. Um, I went back into hospital and at this point I had three cardiologists standing around me saying that the ECG was telling them I was having a heart attack but they still didn't believe it. So would I like to go home? And I said, no thanks. Um, the cardiologist on call in the uh, emergency room actually said, I'm going to bet you a million pounds you haven't had a heart attack. So obviously I am going to go back and find him one day because he's going to have to pay up. Things kind of went from bad to worse. The pain got worse. It was breaking through the drugs they gave me. Eventually I got wheeled into coronary care. This was before coronary care, coronary care was open all night. It wasn't at that stage where, where I was. I was treated over in Coventry. And uh, so the team had to come out of bed to do the angiogram. And when they did it, they saw a complete dissection of the LAD, which is the artery down the left-hand side of your heart. So there was nowhere they could do a bypass. There was nowhere they could put stents. The artery was gone. So my husband was called to come in and say goodbye to me. The cardiologist had never seen anything like this. It took about five days for me to get diagnosed. And he came and he went, ah, oh, I found what it is. It's this thing called SCAD. Um, I was considered postpartum because my youngest baby was nine months old and I just stopped breastfeeding her. So hormones were just, I was like this, wanting to kill people. And um, so we feel, we felt there was definitely a hormone reason for that to happen. Once I was diagnosed, I was told, the great news, it's never going to happen again. It's one in a gazillion trillion. You're going to be fine. So that's where I want to pick up the story for lots of the new people, because I can help you feel better about where you are right now. Because it's your heart, it plays with your head. Do you get that? If you had had an attack in the thigh muscle, um, and at the end of the day, that leg felt tired, you would milk it for all you could. You would have that leg up and say, oh, bring me a cup of tea, darling. I can't possibly do the hoovering. It wouldn't play with your head at all because it's your thigh. Thighs don't play with heads, but because it's your heart, it plays with your head. So many people, are, and um, I mean, a show of hand for the, for the, with the people that her you know, a longer survivors of this. Put your hands up if you uh, understand that it, it's a head game rather than a body game. Yes. Your heart, you're all here. You're all looking well. We've had this thing happen to us and you've come through it. You're okay. You're being taken care of. So your heart, you're okay. 
but your head doesn't know that. Now there's the guy or the lady who lives next door to you who hasn't had this happen to them, hasn't had any sort of heart attack, and they're going, whew, I'm okay, Jack, I'm all right. This isn't gonna happen, it's happened to them, but it's not happened to me. The difference is it has happened to you and you're still here. So that's the good news. That's the good news. That wasn't determined before this event happened. And all the research shows that the more, uh, that if this ever does happen again, you'll be okay. Your body is incredibly clever, but because it's your heart, it plays with your head. So I've been watching, I don't comment often on the Facebook page, but I, I do watch what comes up. And something that I wanted to address is something that lots of people say is, oh, I wanna get back, and when can I get back to my exercise? And I appreciate, David, what you said, you know, it's up to you, there's no reason why not. But the thing that I want you to think about and start to appreciate is you just listen to your body. No disrespects to the, to the wonderful doctors and medics, but you know what you're capable of. I know if I'm having a good day and I'm feeling great, then I can get on and do everything. I also know if I wake up one morning and I'm just feeling not quite right and I'm thinking I'm a bit more breathless than normal my legs are really heavy that's my body telling me I need to slow down so it's not one size fits all on your rehabilitation it's about listening to your body because you're the expert on how you feel the other thing I want to just talk about is that you do go through a grieving process though so put your hands up if you recognize that now, I was, you're clearly much smarter than me because I didn't get that at all. I had my first heart attacks, my first SCAD, um, and I was so busy surviving. I was a mum of three, um, three under five. I felt control had been taken away from me. I felt I can't, I'm not even allowed to be with a baby on my own. The baby was wanting me to lift her up, and at the time, the advice to me was, no, you can't lift. She was quite a chunky baby. The advice was, you mustn't lift the baby up. And I certainly didn't feel safe and strong enough to do that. Um, so I always had to have someone with me. I felt control had been taken away. I was a high achiever. Albeit, at that time in my life, my achievements consisted of having matching socks and getting out of the house without baby sick down my back. I mean, that, that was it, that, those are my achievements. But still, I was, I'd always achieved what I set out to do. All of a sudden, that was taken away from me. So the ones of you who are struggling and thinking, when am I gonna get back? When am I going to be that person again? You will, but it takes time. It takes more time emotionally than it does physically, and it takes enough time physically so just, just remember, when you're feeling a little bit tired, think if your leg was aching, you'd rest it. If they said to you, do you know what, in a year's time, that still might play you up a little bit every now and again, you'd be fine with that, wouldn't you? So your heart is a muscle in the same way that your thigh muscle works. The difference is this gets to rest at night, and when you put your feet up, and the heart actually doesn't, because it has to keep going. So sometimes things can take a bit longer. So don't rush it, is my advice. And this is only my advice. I felt when I had the energy, I could do it. And when I didn't have the energy, don't beat yourself up about it. Don't worry that anything else is going to happen. Just appreciate that you're fixing, you're getting better. I'm all about the just in case. And it's all about building up confidence for you because hands up who's had a knock in their confidence since, well, just about everybody. Of course it knocks your confidence because you think you're going to drop down dead at any minute. I mean, nobody, nobody can take that fear away from you, but it does subside. I've got some great tips to help with that. The first thing is the person that says to you, oh, we could all get knocked over by a bus tomorrow, you're allowed to punch them. <laughs> That's number one, because that's not helpful. And the difference is, the people that say that, I'm sure I've said it in the past, but the people, oh, the people that say that don't think they're going to get knocked over by a bus tomorrow. And my, my reply is, bloody hell, have I got to worry about a bus? As well as the heart, have I really got to worry about that as well? Um, so you're just in cases, it's about taking precautions, 
but as David said, it is about putting it in a box, and I can give you some tips on that. Everywhere I go, I've got my little red folder, which is stuck together with sellotape, and I mean, God, they're going to have to have really good eyesight, because it had to fit in a little Chanel bag, <laughs> so I had to do it really small. <laughs> Um, so I've got a really little copy of my ECG that fits in a Chanel bag and, and a letter and oh and you've got it tattooed on you perfect <laughs> well done yeah well done so it's a case of taking things with you always have the red spray with me and in the early days it really helped to say to people if I was out with groups of people it would really help me to say uh, look, if ever I don't feel unwell, I've got these in my little Chanel bag, okay? And this is what you need to do. Because it would just be a case of sharing the information to make sure that you felt better. And it's about alleviating stress off your shoulders. Uh, when we talk about recurrence, I was meant to be at the last conference two years ago. And very sadly, I didn't make it because unfortunately, I had a recurrence. However, what I want to say to you is, what you were talking about, the different risk factors for it. I have FMD, we think. Um, I had a complete dissection of the LAD artery. And then two years ago, a week before I was due to come and talk at the conference, on my birthday, I fell over nothing. I like to say my husband pushed me, but he didn't. Um, I fell over, landed flat on my face, completely bashed up my face and broke my elbow. Um, for the next hour after that happened, I was like this giddy, crazy woman who was waving my arms out. And apparently that was adrenaline. I, I think I'm like that most of the time, but apparently that was adrenaline. And it wasn't until an hour later that I went, ow, what's happened here? X-ray, sure enough, I'd broken my elbow. A week after that, I woke up and I had the same pain. Now, those of you that worry about recurrence, I. I'd got to the stage where I didn't worry about it. I'd done 12 years, and I absolutely swear, if I hadn't have had that fall and that whoosh of adrenaline in my head, that's what caused the next one. Um, so I think the fear of recurrence is always, always there for you. But I think you have to put it into some kind of perspective and realise that life isn't worth, it's not worth worrying about. I have these, those of you that watch on my Facebook uh, thing, I've been doing these 365 days of positivity. And one of the reasons I started that was because I appreciate and notice in myself that I have to proactively be positive. So if you're struggling a little bit with feeling positive, living with this condition, and lots of you are nodding, don't expect it just to happen okay but you can help it along and you will get there don't expect it just to happen i'm naturally tinged with a little bit of depression i take antidepressive tablets for it and i'm never coming off them the whole of my life i don't care what anyone says i i found a nice stable place and i i don't care i'm staying on them um, but also, in addition to that, in the mornings, I wake up, well, my first thought is, oh my God, I'm still here. So my first mantra is, every day above ground is a good day. When the children were little, I'd go down and say, you're so lucky, your mummy's still gorgeous. <laughs> and what I actually meant was, you're so lucky, your mummy's still alive. <laughs> and, you know, living with that, I can see by your face that some of you recognise that. So there are ways that you can work around it. We are clever, but we're not that clever. We actually can't think of two things at once. Well, girls, obviously, we can. <laughs> but emotion-wise, you cannot feel sad and worried if you're feeling happy. It's impossible. We're just not that clever. So when you have fearful thoughts coming into your mind, get a positive, a happy thought, and push it out of the way. And whatever that is, I mean, I won't share with you the things I think about. Um, uh, I, you, you can think about whatever you like, but it's impossible to have these fearful thoughts when you're thinking happy thoughts. 
I'm going to share this with you every morning I get in the shower and you're going to think I'm completely crazy but it's like a positivity the water coming over me I take 10 or 15 minutes every morning to think right I've woken up I'm still here that's good and now I'm going to get on and I have my shower and I think right that's all positivity I'm going to have a good day I'm not going to have negative thoughts I'm not going to worry and you can train your mind to be like that. Does that help a little bit for those of you? Because I know lots of you, I can see you're, you're, you're struggling with that. And hopefully that just helps a little bit. The other thing we spoke about was grief. After something like this happens to you, you go through a period of grief. I lost my mum a few years ago and I grieved... I wallowed in it because it kept me close to her and I wanted it. I didn't want to be okay. I wanted to cry because I'd lost my lovely mum. And I made no apologies for that fact at all. Um, I understood it was a process that had a beginning, a middle and an end. And I'm out of that grief for my mum now. And I now, th I miss her, but I think about her happily. But looking back, it was definitely a process. Now, I went through the same process after my heart attacks. I was grieving the loss of my health. I'd been one of those people that said, oh, anyone could get run over by a bus um, because you don't think it's going to happen to you, do you? Um, but looking back, I definitely went through a grieving process. And I think life would have been a little bit easier for me in the beginning had I appreciated that and gone with the flow a bit more and not be so determined to be super strong and, right, I'm going to get on this, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to do... You know, if I'd have just given myself a bit of time. So those who are new, if you're having down days, my advice is just be gentle on yourself. Just let it be and then you'll be okay. Because when you're going through grief, each time you have a cry, you feel better afterwards. Does that make sense? Have I covered everything I want to cover? Because I'll go on for about 12 hours otherwise. Uh, yeah, have we got our friends from the ambulance service here? Have they turned up? No. The other day I launched, um, oh, I helped to launch a critical care car in Birmingham. Um, and it's part of the air ambulance. Uh, service. So where the ambulance, air ambulance can't land in, the, in Birmingham city centre, then this critical car care comes in that has the same uh, equipment. <coughs> and I was speaking to the West Midlands ambulance guys and saying, I've had a real problem. So November, uh, yeah, November 2016, when I had my recurrence heart attacks, I knew I was having a heart attack. There was absolutely no doubt. And it's different to little bits of chest pain. When you've had a heart attack, you know when that comes again. You will have a very heightened sense of awareness for this area. You'll be feeling every bump, every missed beat. You'll be aware of absolutely everything. And you'll be going, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? You know, you'll know. It's not going to happen. But if ever it does, you will know that this is what it is. I knew I was having a heart attack. 999, ambulance guys came and they said... Uh, we're taking you to Warwick Hospital, which was my local hospital, and I knew I needed to go where there was interventional cardiology. I knew I needed to be at the big centre. They wouldn't believe me because their protocol tells them without ST elevation, you, you, you're, you're maybe not having a heart attack. And he said lots of women your age get angina. Well, I was having a heart attack. I could have kicked him in the ghoulies, but I didn't. Um, women of my age, what does he mean? Um, um, so I've spoken to the ambulance service and they're putting a red flag against my name and my address so that not, <laughs> not because I could have kicked him in not because of that not a warning don't go in with, <laughs> don't go in without police to this one she's mad no to say that if I say I'm having a heart attack trust me now we got my cardiologist on the phone, I have, I wear this, I had all my in cases, but still this guy was determined to stick with protocol that showed no ST elevation, no, you're not going to a big centre, you'll go to the little one, and they, I knew they would have sent me straight on. So I just wanted to say, we were meant to be having um, two people from the ambulance service come today, maybe they'll turn up later on. I'm not sure. Anyway, if you want advice about that, that, that you can speak to them and say, look, this is my condition and this is what I want noted. Um, because we're so rare, we don't necessarily show in the same way. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Um, I think that's about it. The, 
the other thing is, when I say you're getting over your grief um, of this thing happening to you, and you're probably saying, but will I ever feel like me again? Will I ever feel like me? You absolutely will. And life afterwards is good. Now, I, of course, wish this hadn't happened to me because I wish I didn't have the health issues I have now. But I cannot say life is worse because it happened. I would have to say life is better. And that's the truth. That's absolutely 100% genuine. I think I know what life is about. I believe I know what's important. I have children who are now growing up, and they also know. They know never judge a book by its cover. They've got true empathy. They're growing up with a different view on things, and that's kind of my job to do that too. And also, you are okay. You've got this condition, which is going to play with your head more than your heart, but you are all okay. And you will get to this tipping point where you see that life is good. And once you reach that tipping point, you're not there yet, some of you, and it does take time. But once you get to that tipping point, you won't look back. And you'll, you won't be thankful it's happened to you, but you've got two choices. You've always got two choices. You can either sit and think about it forever and worry for the next 30 years that you're going to die. And when you get to that 30 years down the road, you're going to look back and say, what a waste. What's the point? What's the point in that? So you have my uh, best wishes for you all to get better. You're all the winning team because you're here and you're under the great care of all these guys. And as I say, you do have my personal permission to punch anyone who says about the red bus coming to knock you over. <laughs>